welcome. Hi, I'm Craig Shelley. Welcome to this latest edition of our Partner Perspective Series. Um, the best part of our jobs is we get to work with lots of great leaders and learn from them every day. Um, this series allows us to share those insights and share those leaders with all of you. I'm super excited today to have with us Patrick Gaspard, uh, the President and CEO of the Center for American Progress. Um, really has a rich background uh, across labor, electoral politics, public service, philanthropy. Uh, just prior to, to CAP was the, the President of the Open Society Foundations. Um, and held key positions in the Obama administration, uh, including serving as the U.S. ambassador to the Republic of South Africa. Um, and now at the Center for American Progress, really leads an impactful organization that's at the intersection of all of that. Uh, and maybe most importantly, uh, like me, he grew up in New York City. So welcome, Patrick. Uh, happy to have you with us today. Thanks for being here. Great. Thanks for inviting me on and thanks for your partnership. And let's go New York. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, you know, so reflecting on this career that you've had, which is just amazing, it's had so much impact. Um, I think really the central connection is, is, is really been driving change, lifting people up. Um, where do you see the biggest opportunities to drive change today? Um, and how would you characterize kind of the overall health of, of, of the nonprofit sector? Thanks. For, thanks for that question, uh, Craig. I'm, I'm a radical optimist and always think that the ecosystem that I'm working in is going to continue to drive progress, drive it uh, hard, drive it with uh, integrity. But I will say that it's really important right now for nonprofit leaders to uh, really assess and be darned honest about the environmental hazards uh, that we are facing. The environment itself is the biggest challenge that nonprofits have. There's never been more urgency. There's never been less uh, capacity. There's never been more uh, burnout and there's never been as much noise as exists today. It's so much easier now to access information than ever before, uh, but it's really harder to engage with information that can actually challenge your perspective, the worldview of your uh, teams that can get you to kind of shake up your assumptions. It's, it's easy to uh, live in, uh, in silos and to live uh, in uh, bubbles. That's true for nonprofits, uh, and it's also true for donors, uh, though less true for donors who, let's be candid, uh, are uh, of a generation, of an era that pays far less attention to the noise. So nonprofits, uh, in order to break through, attract donors, sustain those donors, uh, have to make sure that we are um, uh, able to set our tuning forks uh, beyond, beyond the proximity of what we're getting uh, in the uh, in the hyper information bubbles uh, that we live in, uh, recognizing that we live in a time when when uh, public policy is moving at the speed uh, of that information, uh, being fortunate enough to serve as uh, uh, you know kind of fellow traveler uh, in politics and government uh, and in uh, philanthropy uh, has enabled me to really uh, narrowly firmly focus in on what exactly matters uh, to move the needle, uh, particularly for working uh, folk uh, and what it means to be able to use all the tools that are available to me in very tangible ways to do that work. All the tools of democracy from uh, organizing uh, to uh, diplomacy uh, on uh, and on. Uh, I have found too often, especially when I served in uh, philanthropy, uh, that too many in the nonprofit sector uh, fail to properly assess their existing strengths and to understand how to fine tune uh, their uh, tools to uh, meet the moment. There are lots of opportunities that will always uh, come uh, at us. Uh, we, uh, when you, when I've been able to serve in the White House, and you discover that even there, the President of the United States doesn't get to set the agenda day to day, but you're in a space of reaction. That's true for the nonprofit sector as well, but you can better react if you're investing in proper and appropriate scenario planning across the board, and if you're assessing your essential uh, superpowers. Uh, at the Center for American Progress, uh, we have a kind of relentless determination to bring into alignment our superpowers of policy generation, communication and outreach uh, and advocacy uh, in ways that are measurable, that have a set of metrics that we're able to uh, apply to them uh, for uh, delivery. We're fond of saying, we don't want to just change the conversation, we want to change the nation. Uh, you can only do that 
uh, if you're uh, able to have a, a kind of uh, pragmatism uh, about uh, your goals, you celebrate uh, your successes, uh, and you continue to invest back uh, into organizational strengths. Oh, that's phenomenal. And I, and I agree. I think, I think organizations can learn so much from this concept of focusing on your superpowers. And I watch you all do it at CAP and it's, um, I don't know, just, it's been amazing to be up close to, but um, so as you've come, you know, this is the time in the world, the time in the ecosystem, so much transition at the same time you're coming to CAP is really only it's, you know, I think third CEO. Um, so even in, in some ways always reinventing itself as an organization, what have been your biggest challenges specific to being the CEO of, 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 of CAP? Well, um, God, those are, those are innumerable. Uh, so <laughs> this year we um, celebrated the 20th anniversary of the Center for American Progress. Uh, and it was just a wonderful uh, opportunity to kind of be nostalgic, to mark the journey and the victories along the way. And, to make sure that we're celebrating those who made those victories uh, possible from uh, staff to our interns, to the elected officials that we're fortunate enough to uh, partner with, to organizations like uh, the org group that have helped us to really strengthen our bricks and mortar uh, operations here. Uh, but uh, when, you know, an anniversaries are a wonderful opportunity, not just to be nostalgic, uh, but to also project uh, into the future? What what do the next few years look like? What does the next decade mean? What are the uh, existential challenges uh, that we're rallying to face or uh, that we are insufficiently uh, built uh, to address? So I've been trying to determine in this period whether or not CAP uh, is fit uh, for purpose in our research work uh, and in our uh, communications work uh, as well. Uh, that uh, invariably leads to some really tough uh, decision making where you've got to put on your your sorting hat uh, and uh, lift up a set of priorities or make a, uh, some tough decisions uh, to go in a different uh, direction after uh, assessing work that you've done in a particular field uh, for many years, hopefully with success, uh, but at other times uh, in ways that... Um, uh, demonstrate uh, the inability uh, to move uh, forward with the coalition with uh, uh, on an issue, uh, and, and you have to understand that you have to live uh, and sustain to fight another day. On sustenance, uh, I also became the uh, leader of this organization uh, during the pandemic, uh, which of course led to a profound economic downturn, some real anxiety. Uh, it, it led to a shrinking uh, in the donor space uh, and a good deal more um, conservatism with the decisions that donors uh, would make uh, for immediate uh, and they're thinking about long uh, term investments. So as we're working to build something that's more sustainable and can ultimately attract resources at the scale that our work deserves uh, and uh, requires, uh, we've had to um, be able to kind of take conversations to to donors about the key challenges that we're having in climate uh, on uh, economic um, inclusion on the expansion of health care uh, on fundamentals questions of rights uh, and justice uh, with a, an appreciation that um, many of us are feeling the fragility of our democratic institutions right now uh, and that there's a, a keen determination that many donors have to really put their chips in the center of the uh, table to bet on democracy. And we had to find ways to make certain that we were speaking to that renewed sense of urgency post January 6th, et cetera, uh, on uh, those bets. And I, I think that we've managed to do that. Uh, we did that with the help uh, of uh, uh, the OR group that really helped us to um, identify more effective and efficient ways uh, to manage uh, strategic engagement, uh, particularly uh, in the space of uh, major uh, gift uh, prospects and high-level uh, philanthropic uh, investments um, that all required a different set of questions uh, and responses from uh, an organization that, uh, in truth, um, grew considerably over the years without um, considering uh, whether or not that, that growth always uh, met um, uh, the needs of uh, the political hour. 
Yeah, no, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. I think you're right. I mean, the, the urgency is opening up lots of opportunities, but it's also making us necessarily more accountable for what we're doing with philanthropic investments that we receive because we need outcomes and we need them today. So uh, no, I couldn't agree more. Um, talking a little bit about the relationship our organizations have had, I guess we've been working together almost about two years now. Um, you know, we started sort of helping evaluate fundraising strategy. Then we did a lot of work with you sort of implementing that strategy and sort of making the culture changes needed. Uh, we've done some executive recruiting work, but I'm curious, like, I mean, what have you seen the impact uh, of uh, at cap of, of working with Orger? Well, there, there, there are a number of things that you've enabled us to to do that we would not have been able to to do if we just tried to organize our research, reset uh, internally uh, without um, uh, external supports. Uh, I'd say that the first most important thing that you did early on in conversations with us is to give us the ability to do comparative analysis, to hold up a mirror from the world that we could look uh, at ourselves in, that we could look through uh, to to, to better understand uh, the landscape uh, that other uh, nonprofits uh, were inhabiting, to better give us a sense of the perspective of uh, for-profit uh, leaders who are making uh, charitable contributions, who are making strategic philanthrop- philanthropic contributions to understand um, the, um, the questions that animate their work and uh, their giving uh, and to uh, help us to better see uh, where we were ahead of the curve, where we were perhaps using uh, practices and tools uh, that um, worked well uh, for a previous uh, generation of leaders, but did not necessarily suit um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the current ecosystem uh, that we need to be able to effectively uh, operate in. So there's a way that you gave us a kind of um, high level telescoping uh, out of the world uh, as it is today. Uh, and then um, beyond that, uh, you and your colleagues at OR rolled up your sleeves, got into the trenches with us, uh, and, it, and enabled us to get a real granular sense uh, of uh, why we were successful with certain types of investors, uh, why um, there was still r- significant room to grow uh, with other partners, how we closed those gaps and those deficits, and what it means to actually take up the notion of a relationship building uh, in the work that we do uh, with investors, as opposed to uh, what traditionally happens when you're trying to meet uh, your goals uh, quarter uh, by quarter towards the end of the year, where a number of urgent discussions and requests uh, go out without um, the work that uh, folks like me who have organizing in their DNA uh, appreciate, which is uh, to be in correspondence, in conversation over time, uh, to make certain that as we have success or even as we have challenges, we're communicating that to our uh, partners and to uh, other prospects uh, in ways that enables them to uh, see the impact of their investment or to make them uh, understand how they are um, built into a set of considerations that we take up uh, in our advocacy work or even uh, the um, intentionality of our coalition tables, the networks uh, that we build, uh, and the kinds of questions that we bring to the White House, to Capitol Hill, and to state capitals uh, as well. Uh, the, it, 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 may, it may sound like an astonishing thing to, to say, but um, with Orr's help, uh, we went from uh, making a set of um, uh, sometimes seemingly random requests uh, to being able to sort those into actual uh, partnered uh, relationships across the board. Uh, that's not to suggest that we didn't have strategy, we didn't have intentionality, we didn't have structure before, or of course we had all of those, uh, but um, we can kind of better see the umbilical cords from one conversation to the next, from one set of relationships uh, to the next uh, in a way that uh, uh, enables you to pull back and to actually see uh, a live network. So it's it's just been just uh, phenomenal. Uh, As we've hired uh, new team members uh, into uh, our development uh, shop, uh, you've helped us to think about what it means to uh, sustain uh, the culture 
uh, so that we're not recreating the wheel every time we have new uh, leadership in place in the organization. So all of that's been rather invaluable. Oh, we, I mean, we appreciate the opportunity to, to do it. It's been a real privilege to work with you and, and, and the whole team, so, so particularly at this moment in time. So thank you. Um, I guess just maybe last thought, like what advice would you give to other nonprofit leaders, other CEOs out there for what, what should they be thinking about? You know, so um, it is really easy to uh, kind of get into your organization, do the hard work of learning that organization, uh, and then operating in the world uh, through um, uh, the, uh, the, the perspective, the kind of engineering uh, of uh, the org uh, that you're in. We live at a time now where the challenges are so extraordinary, so epic, uh, where information is moving uh, so rapidly that it's impossible to have a kind of go it alone uh, program uh, for any of the things that we are trying to accomplish, the things that we're trying to land uh, in spaces of public uh, policy or in uh, public communication. Uh, and all of us are m far stronger uh, together. Uh, and we have to operate as nonprofit leaders with a tremendous sense of humility uh, and appreciation that we don't know everything there is uh, to be known uh, in our fields, uh, our staffs, irrespective of how extraordinary uh, they are, can always be strengthened by partnership, uh, by a little bit of uh, competition, uh, and by the uh, perspectives uh, of others uh, who uh, may not necessarily be entirely aligned with us uh, in this pluralistic society. We're in a moment where so many of the assumptions that we've made about our institutions have kind of been torn asunder. Communities are frayed uh, at the edges. There are cleavages in this nation that were unimaginable to, uh, unimaginable to me and so many others just a short uh, while ago. We don't overcome those challenges. Uh, inside of our own trenches. And, um, you know, I, I, I know that the, for me personally, uh, being able to work with um, so many outstanding partners uh, and being able to bring in uh, the, the kind of rugged professionalism of uh, partners like the Org Group has made all the difference in the world. Thank you. I really appreciate you spending some time with us today. I really appreciate the opportunity to work with you. Um, I know our community will appreciate hearing your thoughts. Um, so thank you so much, Patrick. And uh, everyone else, thank you. And just uh, watch the space. We'll, we'll have more leaders to share with you soon. Thank you. Thank you.